Welcome to the weekly podcast of Bright Star Bible Church. I'm Pastor Michael Branch. As we begin, we pray, Lord, sanctify us in truth. Your word is truth. So this morning, I want to talk about the preeminence of Christ, the preeminence of Christ. And the Bible is very clear, and you're probably, some of you are probably looking up the word preeminence right now. That's okay. You can, you can Google stuff uh, during my sermon. Faith's already Googled me once this morning, uh, so just to prove that I was right. So by the way, if y'all haven't met Brad and Faith McFadden over here, um, they, are, they helped us plant Bright Star Church in Texas, and and uh, just just our our support, they they were we could not have done anything there without them. So we love them, we miss them dearly. And uh, if y'all haven't met them, then then come over and, and say hello to them. And we're glad that you guys are with us today. Their uh, da- uh, Helen is their daughter. Y'all know Helen, so that's their daughter. And of course, our girls are three peas in a pod, and now they're uh, three peas in their new little uh, mobile home. So yeah, their new little hacienda. So we're really excited about that. They're, they're stepping into a new era in their life as are uh, Brad and Faith and Krista and I, as, as the, the kids are flying the nest, right? So um, this morning, uh, let me say first and foremost, this is in no way, uh, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, attack anybody. You guys know how this works if you've, if you've sat under my teaching at all. My whole purpose um, is to rightly divide the word of truth in accuracy. God's word tells us to study to show ourselves approved, or at, at least Paul told Timothy to, a workman who need not be ashamed. And I believe that, that it's, it's so important for us to, to look at Scripture and rightly dissect as that word uh, shows us. It's a scalpel. It's not like using a saw or, a, or hacking away with a machete. It is a, it is a precise and finely tuned a surgeon's instrument, you know, is as cutting the word in proper context so as to properly understand it. So the first thing that I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to start with three uh, statements that will help us understand the nature of Jesus, okay? So we want to know this morning, what is the nature of Jesus? How can we truly understand who He was? And so the first thing I want to start out with is a foundational statement encompassing an e- eternal truth. A foundational statement encompassing an eternal truth. And that is Hebrews 13, 8. And it simply says this. It's very straightforward and to the point. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I've used a word that is immutable. God's word uh, teaches us that God himself is immutable. And that just means he's unchanging. Can you imagine Uh, a being that is unchanging, that never changes, that never has an original thought, that never changes his mind, that never, uh, he just is. He's the great I am. He just is, okay? And so Christ is the same in that nature as God the Father in that he is unchangeable. He is immutable. Um, And remember, this is a key when you're reading God's word is that divinely inspired scripture cannot contradict one another, one another. So if you have two verses that are contradicting, the problem is with you, it's not with God's word. The problem is with your understanding and it is not with the text of God's word. So if your doctrine and what you teach promotes that somehow Jesus has changed the nature of his deity or in his being God uh, or one of the three persons of the Trinity, then you are forcing many contradictions Predictions upon the whole of Scripture. Do you understand? And most of the time, the reason this happens is because, as I mentioned several weeks back, that we try to come to God's rescue and we don't want Him to be seen in a way that might be a bad press to the world, right? Well, we can't let people think this about God, so we have to kind of finagle and twist and change things around so that God always comes across in a way that we feel like is an emotionally stable and, you know, um, pacifying way for us. We don't want anybody to think that God is unjust. But here's the deal. God is not unjust. He's never unjust. So you don't have to come to his defense. Let the word speak for itself. Okay? Second, a statement of his pre-existence. All right? Before creation, before the beginning. John 17, 5. Jesus is praying. This is just prior uh, to his passion or his, uh, his death, his crucifixion. And here's what it says, John 17, 5. Pay close attention to this. He says, And now you, Father, glorify me together with yourself 
um, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world existed. He just, he's just amen and that's all. I'll take it as an amen. Okay, so glorify Jesus in his bodily form was saying, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the same glory that I had before the world existed, before creation existed, okay, with that same glory. So we see here Jesus existed before creation. He was glorified with the Father in eternity past. Now we're going to look at a statement at the time of creation that Jesus was the one who created all things and he was the Word made flesh. And we're going to go to John 1, 1 through 4 or 5 in, in that general region, okay? John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not even one thing that came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. So all life we see flows from Jesus Christ who preexisted as the Word, okay? Apart from him, there is no life. Apart all, all truth flows through him, and apart from him, there is no truth. You understand? By, here's the deal, though. You can't separate Jesus from the truth of his word. And this is why understanding God's word and what God's word is is so very important. We treat it often like it's just some book, right? Um, that it's just a bunch of guys got together and talked about this experience that they had. This is not the way that we view scripture, okay? Okay. The Word of God is so important to understand that, that Christ was the Word that became flesh and then later gave us the Word of God as the divine revelation from God to man for us to hold on to as an anchor in our life and to understand God and His work within the, the world and within the affairs of men, okay? Um, <clears throat> so, in other words, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, authored the Word of God, and completed the writing of those 66 books that you have in your hand that we call the Bible, all right? Don't get it mixed up. Men did not write the Bible. The Holy Spirit God wrote the Bible, okay? So important to understand. So we can't just dismiss it like, well, you know, that was back then and they were really different and whatever. No, you have to understand God himself authored, wrote Scripture, okay? Okay? Again, giving us the exact representation of the Father and all things that He wished to do. Everything He wanted us to know about Himself, about life, about truth, is found in the pages of the Word of God. That book that you hold in your hand or those, those lines of Scripture that you have on your digital device, okay, that, that lots of folks like to use these days. Um, what I'm trying to get across here very clearly is that you cannot separate Christ from the Word of God, from the Bible. Okay? They are one and the same. Um, if you want to know Jesus intimately, if you, then, then search the Scriptures, Genesis to Revelation. Now, uh, so let's get back to that, uh, what I promised, a statement at the time of creation. Let's, let's go back now to John 1 and look through verses 14 through 16. Verses 14 through 16. And the Word became flesh. So He was called the Word before He was called Jesus. Do you understand? He was the Word. He pre-existed creation. He was glorified with the Father before the beginning of the world and all things. So it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about Him and called out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He is the one coming after me. He has proved to be my superior because He existed before me. Now, let me tell you what the, the significance of that statement and why he brought it up. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. They were cousins. And he was saying that this cousin, you know my cousin Jesus, who's six months younger than me? He's superior to me because he preexisted. He was, he was around before I was ever around because he is the great I am. He is the Word who became flesh. Do you understand? So he was properly putting Christ in the context of the preeminence of Christ, that this is the Alpha and Omega, all right? Um, verse 16, it says, For of 
His fullness we have all received and grace upon grace. So through the finished works of Christ, we receive the grace that He has so richly offered to us. And so John, again, he he was making this argument that Jesus is God. He is not a mere mortal man. He is God in the flesh. And he makes the the argument, he continues the argument um, in the very next passage we read in John 1.18. John 1.18, he says, No one has ever seen God the Father, but the, own, but the one and only Son, who is Himself God and is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. So again, just as we have studied that God presents Himself often in Scripture as the otherness of God, the infinite uh, measure of God, He is so much higher and beyond us, Uh, because He is the Creator and we are the creature, right? In the same way, He's doing that, the Word of God is doing that with with Jesus the Christ, with the Messiah. He's saying He is other than you. Do not put Him in the class of a mere mortal man. Colossians 1, 13 through 17. Colossians 1, 13 through 17. For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, verse 15. He is the image. That is, in in Greek, that is icon. He is the icon. Y'all know what an icon is, can't you? You know what an icon is. You guys deal with that all the time in your business, right? They they do marketing and stuff. We use the word all the time. I need an icon for my company. I need a logo, right? I need something that represents. Well, basically what this is saying is he is the image, the, the exact representation of God the Father. It says he is the image, the icon of the invisible God, the firstborn, and that's protococo, prototokos of all creation, the firstborn of all creation. Now, this does not mean that he was simply the first kid born, and then all of a sudden these other Christians come along and they have, and they have all the rights that Jesus had and that they're on the same level as Jesus, Okay. You could take it that way, the same way uh, parents would have a child and then they would have a second child, and you don't treat your second child like a second-class child, right? You love them the same. That's not what we're talking about here. When it says that he was the prototokos, the firstborn of all creation, it means that this is a statement of, again, the preeminence of Jesus Christ, that in him is all life, in him is all truth, In Him all things came into being and all things hold together. In Him all things have their eternal existence. It is in Christ. I'm not making this up, okay? Uh, We'll let the context of Scripture explain this to us. In verse 16 it says, For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, both visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers, or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. Are you starting to get the idea? Jesus Christ created all things invisible and visible, all things physical and spiritual. Are there any other categories? Raise your hand if there's anybody out there that knows another category other than things that are unseen and things that are seen, things that are spiritual and things that are physical. Anybody have any other categories? So it pretty much covers all bases, right? And it says that all that it was created by Him, through Him, for Him. Do you understand? So it's all about Him. All things that exist came from Him. All things that exist, physical and spiritual, are for Him and for His pleasure, for His good pleasure. Verse 17, He is before all things. That's what it means when it says the firstborn. That He was a human that was born with man's flesh that was actually before all things, as John the Baptist mentioned. He pre-existed all of creation, okay? So it sounds to me kind of like that God's Word is kind of trying to make the point that Jesus is kind of a big deal. And not just kind of a big deal, but he, he, not, not only that He's an example, because this is something that's talked about often, that, that we walk in His footsteps and we follow Him and He's our example. Look, that's, that's a tiny, minuscule piece of the pie. Jesus Christ is the biggest deal of all. Okay? He is not just an example. He is the Alpha 
and he is the, the omega. He is the beginning and the end and all things in between. It's all about Jesus from eternity before Genesis. So if you went to Genesis 1-1 and went eternity that way, it's all about him. And if we go to Revelation, the very last verse in Revelation, that way, in eternity, it's all about Him. Do you understand? That's the importance of Jesus. Everything in between as well. It's all about Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about your power, your authority, your ability to, to, uh, to make all the money you want to make or have the healing you want to get. It's not about all of that. It's all about the, the glory of Jesus Christ. I like, I wrote it down this way. It's all about the glory of the beauty, the beauty and the oneness of the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The unity between the Trinity. It's all about that. That, that we get to partake in that eternal relationship, the Father to the Spirit, the Father to the Son, the Spirit to the Son, the Spirit to the Father, and so on and so forth. You see, there's this perfect unity in the Trinity. And the story's not about us. It's about God. And we get to partake and be a part of that, to bask in, bless you, to delight in that glorious unity of the Trinity, the life, the love, the truth, that exudes from God in the three persons of the Trinity. Jesus is God. He existed before all things. By Him and through Him and for Him, all things were created. In Him, all things have their existence and hold together. Remember what we talked about a couple weeks ago, if somehow Christ could back away from His creation or cease to hold things in existence, things would just fly apart and, and, and dissipate and cease to exist. That's what it's talking about. And that's Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. He is Lord over all. A very interesting account uh, in Luke 8.28. Luke 8.28, these fallen Elohim, these demonic beings, which uh, possessed the man at Gadari. Uh, they called out by the name Legion that there were myriads of demons that were possessing this man. Uh, we see these fallen supernatural beings address Jesus. And so often it's depicted as these demons like cursing and jeering and, you know, the name of Christ or whatever. But I want you to pay close attention to this passage and see the, uh, see the um, man, the word I'm trying to think of, the, uh, their actions and how they react to Jesus. First, starting in verse 27, uh, Luke 8, starting in verse 27, we're going to read 27, 28. And when he stepped out onto the land, a man from the city met him who was possessed with demons, and he had not put on clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but among the tombs. So this, uh, this guy's completely nuts because he's demon-possessed by myriads of demons. He's naked, running around, living among the tombstones, okay? Cutting himself, all kinds of craziness. Verse 28, And seeing Jesus, he cried out, and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What business do you have with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. These demons, they did not spit on him. They did not show irreverence. They did not curse at him. They fell down on their face before the one they knew created them. They cried out with a loud voice. They were prostrate at the feet of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And they begged Jesus not to torment them before the appointed time which they know is coming when Christ will uh, uh, subject all powers and authorities under His feet and they will be cast into everlasting fire. So that's what they were begging Him not to do at that time. There was no question whatsoever. Folks, this is called worship. But it's not the kind of voluntary worship that you and I take part in on a Sunday morning. This is the every knee will bow, every tongue will confess kind of worship that Scripture talks about. The kind of worship, as I said, that cannot be resisted. When the creature recognizes its place standing before the Creator of all things. People I've, I've heard say, well, when I stand before God... He can send me to hell and I'll have a party in hell. Like I've heard people say that. 
No, when you stand before God, you are going to melt like butter. And everything, anything and everything that He's created that has a will of its own, that stands before Him, will have the same reaction. And there will be no excuse. There will be no pointing fingers saying, well, He said or she did or whatever. No, we're going to stand before God and give an account just like this, this fallen being in this uh, very amazing moment we see in the pages of Scripture. This spirit knew that this is God, the preeminent Christ, the Creator, and the Judge in that moment. Now, good doctrine is proven true by various passages throughout all of Scripture. And what I like to call this is harmonizing Scripture. I didn't come up with that. I'm sure I heard somebody say it. But I like it because it's kind of, y'all know how harmony sounds. It's like you have the melody and then there's like three-part harmony. And when it's all sung together, it's absolutely gorgeous, right? It's just beautiful. Well, Scripture does the same thing. You find Scriptures in Hebrews and Scriptures in John and Scriptures in Revelation that harmonize and teach a flowing doctrine throughout Scripture, okay? And so you don't cherry-pick Scripture like you're picking things off of a... uh, picking Scriptures and then you're mushing it all together and forming it into whatever you want it to be, okay? That's not how you study God's Word, but that's exactly what seems to be happening by the majority of folks these days because they are not willing to do the study and the work to truly get their nose in the pages of Scripture and really see the linear uh, hand of God and the Spirit of God moving throughout the pages of Scripture. So we'll see as as in this next case with our passage in Hebrews 1, it really bolsters or supports or harmonizes with all the other passages that we've read today. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, so He's saying He used to speak through angels, through prophets, through judges, through all these things. Excuse me. He spoke in many portions and many ways. In these last days, by the way, this is way back then, and He's calling it the last days. So if those were the last days, we're still in the last days. We're just kind of in the last, last days, right? It's like uh, one day closer to Jesus coming back. So it says, uh, verse 2, In these last days He has spoken to us in His Son, whom He, here we go, appointed heir of all things, through whom He also made the world. Verse 3, He is the radiance of His glory. He reflects the nature of God. Right? Remember the transfiguration that we studied? Where it was like He gave us just a glimpse He said, we saw him transform before our eyes like I used the example of like a lantern, an old gas or propane lantern that you light up and it just keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter and then all you can see are these little spots because you kept looking at at the filament in the lantern. If you can imagine Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration from the inside out emanating this glory, this light of God, and it, and it permeating His clothing, and He became the brightness of God's glory, okay? The exact representation of His nature. He upholds all things by the word of His power. All right? He had made, when He had made the purification of sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty, of the majesty on high, which is God the Father, having become so much better than the angels to the extent that He has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did He ever say, You are My Son? Today I have fathered you. And again, I will be a father to Him, and He will be a son to Me. And when He again brings the firstborn into the world, this, so there it's again using that same word that we read in Colossians, um, meaning all life, all truth, all creation comes, uh, was created by Him, through Him, and for Him. And then verse 8, but regarding the Son, listen to the language it says, but regarding to the Son, He says, your throne God is forever and ever, and the scepter of righteousness is the scepter of His kingdom. Verse 10, and you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. There's His immutability that He's going to be around forever. They all wear out like a garment, verse 12, and like a robe you will roll them up like a garment. They will also be changed, right? The new heaven and the new earth. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. 
So the prophetic message prior to Christ's coming was that the Word who existed and was glorified together with God before the beginning, who by Him and through Him and for Him and His pleasure all things were created, God, the Word, would take on the flesh of man and would be called Jesus. He would take the name Yeshua. Being 100% God and 100% man, He would fulfill both, satisfy both sides of the Abrahamic covenant, the blood covenant that he's, that God cut with Abraham. So he would satisfy it as a man and he would satisfy it as God because let me tell you, man can't do it. It had to be God that did it. It had to be both. This means the son of, uh, that as the son of man, he would have to lay his body down and allow his body to die as that sacrifice. As the son of God, he would also absorb the spiritual penalty of the sin of all mankind. That's your personal sin and my personal sin. And folks, a mere mortal man could not have accomplished this. As 1 Corinthians 15, 20 through 28 says, it reveals to us that the God-man would become the first fruits of the resurrection, guaranteeing a bodily resurrection in the future for all of the elect, all of His children. He would ascend and sit enthroned at the right hand of the Father until the appointed time in which God, as Paul states, will make all enemies your footstool. They will be subjected under the feet of Jesus Christ. So again, this is describing the reign of Christ. Um, until that very last enemy is destroyed, which is death. I guess we kind of crank the heat in here maybe, and it's getting a little warm. I'm hot too. I'm like in polar fleece up here. So hang with me a few more minutes, okay? I'm all, I, we're going to get uh, to the end here in just a few minutes. You guys should, again, we read 1 Corinthians, part of 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. So this, in a nutshell, is the eternal story of Jesus from His eternity past existence to His eternity future existence. He is the God-man. There's no way around that. There's a theory today. It's actually a heretical doctrine that's been around for some time, uh, but in recent years it's been making a, com a comeback, and um, I don't use that word heresy lightly, okay? Um, I, I don't like using that word because I think sometimes people throw it around too quickly and, and too often, but in this case it absolutely is heresy. Um, and if there was any teaching that embodied uh, another gospel or teaching something that is scripturally just inaccurate based upon the scriptures we just discussed this morning, it would be the doctrine referred to as kenosis. Not to be, um, not to be confused with ketosis, right, which is something about the Atkins diet or something. But, uh, th but again, it does have to do um, with the body, and it's from this word, the Greek word kinu, which means to empty, all right? And it's used in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, which is where this, unfortunately, this heretical doctrine stems from is a misrepresentation or a misreading. Um, because all, and it's unfortunate because all you have to do is allow Scripture to speak for itself. Just read it in its context, and it will tell you what it's talking about, okay? So now I've concluded my introduction of the sermon. And why are you laughing? Uh, I want to read this passage to get clarity. I'm, I really am just kidding, okay? Uh, but let's read through this passage. So this, again, this is a Philippians 2, 5 through 8. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. So first and foremost, it's an attitude. It's not talking anything about somehow physically emptying yourself of yourself. And it's not talking about him emptying himself of his deity, of his godliness, of, the, of his nature, godlike nature, which is what uh, uh, this teaches, okay? It's an attitude, an act of humility in which Jesus uh, stepped down from heaven. Verse 6, it says, "...who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped." So, if I'm six foot nine and I'm at the store and I'm trying to reach something on the top shelf, I do not... Re regard that as something to be grasped because I'm equal with the height of the top shelf. I can just grab it, right? I didn't have to reach up to get it. It's, it's very simply, uh, very easy for me to grab a hold of. That's what this is talking about. He did not regard equality with God something to be grasped because he was equal with God the Father. You understand? Now, I love what the King James Version says. Brad and I talked about this last night. Um, King James uses this phrase. It says, um, 
that equality with God, that he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, if I'm in that same store and I grab that can of beans and I shove it in my coat and I run out, that's called robbery. Well, Jesus can grab the can of beans and walk out of the store because he owns the store. Do you understand? There's no robbery. There's no reaching. He's God. That's the whole point of the passage is to say he's God. He didn't empty himself of being God at all. Uh, He was God. He owned all of creation because he is the pre-existing, preeminent Christ, the unique one, the one and only Christ. He emptied himself, and there's the word, emptied, that uh, kinos, by taking the form of a bondservant and being born in the likeness of of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So that, that phrase, emptied himself, kinos, to empty, to deprive of content, follow me, this is interesting, to make unreal, to abase, to neutralize, and even it says to falsify. Well, that's interesting when we're talking about Jesus. What in the world could that mean? It means that the reality doesn't jive with what's being presented. He was God in the flesh. He could have called 10 billion angels down to his aid, and yet in a almost falsified way, he humbled himself by being born as a tiny little baby, right? And he did the work of his father. He was obedient to his father, even to the point of death on the cross. He emptied himself of his heavenly rights and his heavenly dominion and all that he had when he was glorified with the father before the beginning. Do you understand what it's saying? It's not saying in any way that he emptied himself of his nature of being God. All right? The reality was that Jesus was equal with God. Every time he healed, every time he declared someone's sins forgiven, every time he walked on water or calmed a storm, every time he multiplied food, every time he cast out demons, never did he empty himself of his deity, of his nature, but he was constantly reminding us that I am the pre-existent Christ. I am the great I am. I am the Alpha and Omega. I created all these things, so it's nothing for me to say, peace be still. I created these fallen spiritual beings, so it's nothing for me to say, come out of the man. I am the Lord over all. That's the whole point of all the miracles and all of that. He's equal to and in perfect union with the Father. He is equal to and in perfect union with the Holy Spirit. Okay? His physical body was crushed, but the invincible, unique firstborn of all creation from which all things were created by, through, and for, the everlasting word, God, was absorbing the supernatural penalty of your sin and mine because, again, only God could accomplish this. It couldn't have been a man. It just, if, it, if Jesus was just a man, we're all toast. Let's just say it that way, all right? But his purpose... And the reason he did what he did and he humbled himself and went to those great links was out of his love for his creation so that he may reconcile us into right relationship with God the Father, with him, with the Holy Spirit again. That was his purpose. He didn't come to do a magic show, okay? And, and, and unfortunately, so many people these days, they just want the power. They just want to be able to to do the cool stuff, just like the people who he fed the 5,000, they followed him around to the other side of the lake, and they're like, hey, Jesus, can you give us some of that miracle-making mojo? We want some of that stuff. Whatever that is, give it to us. We want to multiply our own food. And he says, let me tell you something. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and guess what their end result was? They still died. The miracle didn't change where they were headed. And then he went on to say, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. I'm the preexistent Christ. I am the living well. I am the bread of life. You cannot exist in any other way except through me. You don't need miracle-making mojo. You don't need more food. You need me to be the number one priority of your life. And through me, you will have life. And through me, you will experience what it means to know truth. I don't understand the psychology behind 
the folks who are wanting to present Christ as being just a man who was filled with the Holy Spirit and was walking as our example so we can do all the things that Jesus did. I don't, I honestly don't understand that, that mentality. And there's all kinds of churches out there. Um, I mean, I've named them before the church of Bethel. Uh, you know, Bill Johnson teaches this constantly. Basically, he says, you read the four gospels, that's all you need to do right there. The, the perfect theology is just reading what, what Jesus did in the four gospels. And that's absolutely wrong. When Jesus resurrected and he was walking on the road to Emmaus, he didn't tell them all about what he had just did. He pointed back to the Old Testament and said, showed them all the things in the Old Testament in the scriptures that concerned him and how he fulfilled all of those things. Okay? So Jesus was, was wrong if, if, in fact... All perfect theology is found in just the four Gospels, which incidentally, incidentally weren't written yet, okay? He pointed back to the Old Testament to show that he was the pre-existing, pre-eminent, unique Messiah, that he was the one all prophecy was focused on and pointing to. When we want to make it about us, when we want to have the power, when we want to have the miracle mojo and make it, you know what I mean? We basically want to be little gods. We want to be the masters of our own fate and do all the things that we want to do. Okay? That's the exact same thing that Satan did. That's the exact same thing that Adam and Eve did. Satan said, I shall be like the Most High. Adam and Eve said, they looked at the fruit and they saw that it would, was desirable to make one wise, that if they ate of that, they would know good and evil just like God. It's the same thing trap over and over and yet people can't see that they're falling into that same trap when they want to be little gods today. But here's the key. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's always been about Jesus and His glory. Because of Jesus, because of His grace, His mercy. Again, we get to partake in that divine, beautiful union between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And forever we get to live to bask in the light of His glory and His love and His mercy. And we get to feel that relationship between the Trinity. I can't delight in it. I can't wait. It's going to be incredible. All because of what Christ came to do when He walked on this earth. He was born in a manger and He was bruised and crushed and paid the penalty for my sin. And now... I get to be reconciled to God because of His finished work. That's what it's about. That's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you are encouraged by the truth of God's Word. If you're in the Tulsa area and are looking for a local church family that teaches God's Word, then join us at 1030 every Sunday morning. Or you can join us live online on our Facebook page or YouTube channel. Until next time, brothers and sisters, as Paul instructed, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you.